Hello, I'm Robin, and welcome to this New Year edition of Molten Music Monthly. Yeah, I didn't really get my act together enough to put on a, a proper December Molten Monthly, so we've just snuck into January, and I figured, well, what the heck? Let's throw it together anyway. There was a couple of things that did come out in December, and perhaps I've got the whole of 2023 just to look back through briefly before we go stumbling on into the abyss of 2024. So that's exciting. I don't know about you, but I had a, a wonderfully interesting and diverse Christmas sort of slash New Year time. <laughs> I redid a bathroom. That was fun. I broke our entire heating and hot water system. That was also fun. Had some fabulous food, some fabulous friends and family, then got the flu. So here we are though, feeling somewhat better. Ready to go on. Shall we keep on doing this? I mean, I'm gonna keep on doing this. We're nearly at 50,000 subscribers. That long, hard, very slow road is, is soon going to materialise, and that's that's super exciting. And there's other things coming up as well, like Synth East, just around the corner. I got to get me out together on that good golly. And as usual, I've got the I've got the shed to tidy. I've got things to do, things to make, fabulous things to do over there, and crazy things to do over there. Other stuff to bring together, things to build, things to you know just be excited and enthused over because this year is going to be one of the greatest years that we have ever encountered for reasons I have not yet come up with. But it's going to be. And it starts off with a really good ramble out of nowhere like this one. So what we're doing, right, so this video I'm going to have a look back through 2023, my favourite things of each month coming along. But before we do that, we do have some news. We have some news. So let's do that first. Let's get to it. <laughs> let's get to it. <laughs> I don't know what's become of me, really. I mean, I used to be able just to pull this out of the bag, and now I'm just dragging in every cliche I could, I could possibly find. Hey, why don't you subscribe and ring the bell? What does the bell do? Is it, does anybody does anybody know? Anyway, do that because you know if I'm if I'm coming up with the cliches, then we should be going with that. I'm, oh yeah, I've got a Patreon as well. You should go and sign on to that and give us some money. That would be also great because this year, am I going full time? Now, the funny thing is, is that somebody told me I was already full time, and when I think about it, I kind of am. But I'm not full time doing lovely videos for for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full-time working for myself, writing stuff about music and things. Anyway, I digress. So what happened in December? Can anyone remember? Or are we all too frazzled? Oh, yes. So kicking us off, Arturio had a couple of little things up its sleeve. Nothing like blindingly fabulous, but it did have an update to the Mini Freak. Mini Freak is a very cool synthesizer, which is up there behind me. It's probably the synthesizer I use the most out of all the synthesizers I don't really use very much. I use that one the most, I think, because it's just got a great range of sounds. It's instantly enjoyable just to sit down and start to play, and things kind of work as you expect. And every single one of those algorithms that's inside, every single one of those sort of oscillators, just has a flavor to it and a movement and dynamicism to it that's just really good to feel your way into. You don't need to know anything about it. Just dial up a couple of notches, play with those other knobs, play with the filter, and it's it's fun. It's fun, 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 fun all the way. So there's been a big update to the Mini Freak 2.0, and that has included a wavetable engine. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it didn't have wavetables? Now I know, that's what I said. I said to Arturia, what do you mean it doesn't have wavetables? When did it not have wavetables? I mean, wavetables are the first thing that you do, isn't it? So no, apparently it never had wavetables. It had all these other waveforms and algorithms and bits kind of pulled in from the plats and mutable instruments and that kind of thing. And that's groovy. And they've also brought in some waveforms from noise engineering, which are fantastic. So lots of really good stuff, but they never actually had the wave table-y kind of moving backwards and forwards within a table of waves. It now has. So that's great, and that's a free update to anyone who's already got it, and it mirrors itself completely on 
the software version as well, so you can see all the lovely wavetables. Lovely. There are some other bits and pieces too. There's a little bit of enhanced NFO. There's a new super unison effect, which is a bit kind of chorusy. <laughs> And there's more sounds and you can now save things as favorites so you can actually find the sound you like that is perhaps my biggest complaint no no i'm sure there's other complaints but anyway one of my complaints was that you could find something nice you found a nice sound and then you go away and come back and you can't really remember where it is so the ability to favorite something just means you can put it into a list so you can just go and refine the ones that you really liked so what else did Arturia do? Well, they bumped up the V collection to version 10. So the V collection is essentially the collection of all the instruments that Arturia have ever made, more or less. And so when they come up with a new version, which tends to be every year to 18 months, they throw in the ones that they've done previously. So the new ones you get in this collection do include the Mini Freak virtual version, the Acid TB303 thing that they did, uh, a legendary Yamaha CP70 piano, and a bunch of their augmented, their weirdo hybrid cinematic strings, brass, woodwinds, that kind of thing. If you run it all together with the analog lab interface, you now get something like 10,000. 10,000 sounds. Hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? Fascinating, I find. I mean, Arturia do some fabulous work with their virtual instruments and they're probably what I tend to use the most in most respects because they're so easily recognizable and um, engageable with there's lots of other people particularly sample based ones that stick everything in a weird interface where you're not entirely sure what it is that you're looking at or where it comes from or how it's put together whereas with Arturia ones although you can do them in the mystical analog lab where you never understand what's going on you can run them independently and they look like they're supposed to look and you can just have fun enjoying everything that they've captured about that instrument within the single interface and I like that. So if I want a Moog, I just type in Moog and it, it comes up. If I want a, I want a Jupiter 8, I do that. If I want a CS80, I do that. You know, it's all there, is my point. And if you're looking for something more creative, more interesting, more, more modern, then Pigments is there to pick up all that kind of slack. The other thing they've updated is their, ugh, this heavy old one, the Keystep Pro. This keeps knocking around. I can't seem to quite get rid of it at the same time. I can't really fully embrace it. It walks that line between modular, CV gate and MIDI and regular synthesizers. It has a keyboard so it pulls you into a melodic direction at the same time as having all this lovely possibility for hands-on modulation changes, transposing, drum sequencing, mixed modulation and bits and pieces. So it offers a huge amount while at the same time making you feel that this is too musical somehow. I need to reject it because I want to work on, on knob sequences and more analogy feely sort of stuff. Because it does bring a, a digitally musically interesting vibe to your modular. And that's not always what you want. Sometimes it is. And I, I kind of get the feeling that my life would be so much easier if I just fully embraced the Keystep Pro I just went with that as my as my songwriting partner because then I would be writing songs as opposed to just fiddling and farting around on an endless stream of nonsense of rotating sequences and then changing and then doing something else. But I'm never here. I'm not here to make my life easier. I'm not here to to embrace the simple and the easy way. I'm here to agonize and and pontificate and procrastinate so that you don't have to. Oh yes. So along with the update, which gives you things like program changes, I think latched transposition, fixed velocity, sort of things again, you kind of think, weren't they there already? They've also done a black one, a fully black one, because this isn't everyone's cup of tea. I mean, actually I quite like it. I like the coloring. I find that helpful. I'd like the colouring to remain with the rest of it being in a bit more of a black type of thing. But they've gone all in on the black, black on black with black with lights up. That's enough about all that, I think. It's not even a new product. I'm just talking about firmware updates and I've probably spoken for half. Anyway. Next up is the Moog Mariana. I like this. I got this right at the beginning of the month. In fact, I was able to play on it a little bit before the release and put together a bit of a video. It's a lot of fun. 
it's definitely Moog-esque. I mean, at the moment, we don't really know what Moog is up to because they've recently been bought out by In Music and they've fired a lot of people. There's a lot of changes afoot. I'm uh, not quite sure if the distribution in the UK is staying the same or whether it's moving on. There's all this kind of uncertainty going on. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the people who program the programs have done a flipping marvellous job on the Mariana bass synthesizer. The idea is that you put in all the bass vibes from the... I don't know, the sub faddy, the Taurus pedally thing, and the Minimoog itself, I suppose, pull all together those sort of vibes, stick it into a software synth, and just make it go warp. And uh, I think they did that quite successfully. I mean, I, I don't have enough warp in, in my computer, and so having this come in and do a little bit of warp is, uh, is very, very welcome. So, so good job. <laughs> good job. I mean, it's simple enough. It's got a, it's got two synthesizers squished together with a couple of oscillators each, each one tracking the other. Sort of, they're meant to be together. And at the same time, you've got kind of a separate sub that you can also do interesting things with. So you've got a dual oscillator thing happening, a sub, different filtering going on, lots of modulation, two layers of this thing so you can stick it together and create pretty awesome, huge sounding sounds. At the same time, it has an internal CV engine built into it, which can also run into the Moga Foga pedals. So the Moga Foga, Moga Foga pedals, which her software version came out uh, earlier in the year, had this ability to modulate each other. So you load up different instances and you could rote the LFO from one to the other. You can now do this with the Mariana as well. And that perhaps hints at a further development down the line where more and more of Moog synths are going to have this internal modulatable structure, which I think is absolutely fantastic. It could potentially be something that other third parties could hook into and it could create this entire behind the scenes language control system of being able to modulate things from other things, which is fantastic. I mean, can't MIDI already do that? I hear you say, well, yeah, but most virtual instruments are very much self-contained and don't like to send out their stuff to other things. And this gives you a back door to provide all of this control voltage style modulation between different plugins. It's just quite brilliant, quite, quite brilliant. But that aside, the sound of the Mariana, I think, is top notch. It sounds very analog to me. I know we've had this discussion <laughs> in the YouTube comments on my video about it as to what the heck is analog anyway. It does anyone really care? And I don't know that I do. What I do know is that I like the sound of things which are slightly off kilter, things which are crapping out a little bit and phasing and rubbing up against each other. That to me makes my view of things seem very analog. It, 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 it just shakes my bones in a way that digital perhaps does not. Even though, of course, it is digital because it's software. So what am I saying? I'm just saying that I don't actually care of, about the source of a sound. I don't care what it is that's making it. All that I care about is how it makes me feel when it hits into my internal organs. <laughs> and so the Mariana felt pretty analog to me. We've had a lot of mixers turn up in Eurorack recently. Stereo ones, modulatable ones, movable ones, digital ones, analog ones, all sorts of ones. The latest one comes from Nano Modules, who make good stuff. You know, I always listen when Nano Modules have a new thing out because it's, it's so far been excellent at every turn. This one, I don't think, is any exception. This is very unimaginatively called the performance mixer. I mean, come on, <laughs> it can do, we could do better than that. So what's the interesting thing about this? I mean, there's a noise engineering one, there's an ultra audio one, there's a, uh, you know, a WMD one, there's all sorts of mixers coming about. But this one in particular kind of grabs my attention because of its ability to record automation. So what that means is that pretty much every knob, every slider, you just hold the record button on the channel, move stuff about, and it will record that. That means you can record levels coming in and out, panning, going left and right, sends to effects, I think. All of that can be recorded into that channel and looped and played back. So you've got the instant ability to mix and let it carry on mixing without you having to be involved in it anymore. It looks really, really nice. It's only slight 
downside is its lack of channel count. It's only got four channels, two mono, two stereo. Then it's got a couple of sends, so you could kind of work those back into giving it a couple more channels, I suppose. But I think when you're looking for a, more of a console mixer in your rack, you kind of want, you're sort of pushing towards six channels, really. That feels like the sweet spot. Four feels a little bit light. I mean, you can do four channel mixing on my motion meter here, four channel motion meter. But then you have all this other stuff in. You've got uh, master outs, Q outputs, headphone outputs. You've got post or pre returns on the effect sense. You've got CV control over flipping everything, which is which is nice. I mean, the feature set is just really spot on. I can't think of a better one. It's just if I could just squeeze it out a little bit further, it would be perfect. And I should say there is an expander for it, but it doesn't sadly give it more channels. It just gives you more access to all of the ins and outs and other bits and pieces. Yeah, I having to cope with a little bit of sort of menu-esque stuff because as you're recording automation, you need to be able to sort of access that and remove it or put it back in. And so there's a certain level of control you're after via LED flashing on the mute button. So there's a little bit of fussiness to get involved in in order to understand everything that's going on. But on the whole, it's a great, great looking mixer. This one popped up just after Christmas and is looking pretty fascinating. This is the Cuisine, the Cuisine from Floating Knobs. It's a sequencer, a 12 track sequencer. Well, it's interesting that they call it a 12 track sequencer because I've been thinking about this and I've sort of decided that, well, most of them are 12 track sequencers actually, although they're kind of four track sequencers, but they're, you know, you tend to have four channels of CV and gate, which is actually eight channels of control voltage. And then you tend to have another four channels of modulation, one for each of those, those tracks, which kind of gives you 12 tracks. And so this is a bit what they've got, but they're kind of focusing on that a little bit more to make it sound perhaps bigger and meatier than it actually is, while at the same time being quite meaty in of itself. I mean, ultimately, in terms of inputs and outputs, you have four CV outputs. So you can use those for notes or you can use them for modulation. You then got eight channels of what can be gates or triggers. So that is really defining what you can do. So you can't do 12 melodies. That's not really what it's saying. You can do four melodies or you can do two melodies and two modulation along with a dirty great big eight channel drum machine. So in, in some ways it's given you an awful lot. In other ways, I feel that it's a shame you can't turn some of those other triggers also into proper CV to give you, like, like I say, you want four, you want four melodies. You want four gates for those melodies. You then want four modulators for those melodies, I feel. Whereas this is perhaps focusing a little bit too much on the gates and triggers. But hey, hey, it's all swings and roundabouts. It depends on what you need. You know, maybe you just want two lines of melody and then everything else is up for grabs. You know, it just depends. Anyway, so it's a great looking device. It can run on your desktop via USB or pop it into your Eurorack. It does have an Erica Synth vibe to it with all of those clicky clacky buttons on it. It's a bit like their drum sequencer. The, the buttons on the front, of course, only give you 16 steps, but you can have 64 in total. So you're going to happen to be paging across and it has a single knob, which apparently does everything of which I'm fairly skeptical. I mean, you can record automation, I think, and you can use that to change notes. It's also got things like chord progressions and transposition all built in there. You can use the pads as a bit of a keyboard in order to put notes in. So there's, it has lots of versatility and facilities inside. It has a Euclidean generator, so you can just kick patterns out and generate patterns very simply out of all the outputs. I like the fact the interface is really clean. So, you know, I'm drawn towards the single knob interface to some degree, provided that it can offer the level of control that you need. I don't want to have to be fussing around trying to find the right mode in order to change things. You want to be able to get to it quickly, but it does very much put it forward as a performance sequencer where you should be able to change things on the fly very quickly, program and off you go. It looks great. <laughs> I'm very interested to have a, a go. Although, as I say, I remain slightly unconvinced about how easy it is to, to navigate the different layers and the different channels that you're playing with. I mean, I enjoy very much the black sequencer from Erica since, but it, it is, it, it does get complicated when you're trying to make sure you're in the right mode on the right track, doing the right thing. 
So whereas the Erica Synth Black Sequencer tends to be a little bit bamboozling with the amount of stuff that's on the front, this has less, and I wonder whether that's going to make it easier or perhaps more difficult to find your way about. It's not available until the middle of January, so we're probably not going to find out anything more about it until then. This is one good-looking trigger sequencer. This is the Nono Modular Major Tom. Good name, possibly. I don't know, I'm still, the jury's still out on the name as such, but this is a polyrhythmic performance sequencer. It's gorgeous. It looks like this is, this is the stuff. It looks like a computer panel on a spaceship, on a proper vintage spaceship. None of this modern nonsense. And what it's offering you is four channels. There's that four channels again. Four channels of, of the rhythmic, polyrhythmic sequencing. It's got a lovely round screen with uh, buttons that go all the way around it. So you've got sort of steps put around the circular screen, the screen in the middle showing you which track or whatever it is that you're affecting, or showing you the pattern overall, and other sort of functional things as well, I think. It's also interesting that not just having the 16 buttons around the outside to represent 16 steps, it's also got sort of buttons in between, which come out as uh, at the corners, which are triplets, it says quite interesting so you can have your 16 steps you can put steps in between just drop those in and drop them out which is a really really interesting idea then on the next section you've got this sort of mirrored section which is four channels you've got channel one this sort of this way up and then channel two next to it upside down channel three and then channel four upside down which is a really really nice way of presenting this interface i think is it going to confuse you being upside down i don't think so because it's you've only got a couple of controls you've got a nice big knob which is selecting different patterns so you store patterns on each one and you can just dial in the one that you want you've got another one which is controlling the length or the first step or something like that of your pattern and then you've got a third knob which shifts the timing of it so you've got i suppose these four channels these four things stacked up in circles don't know what i'm doing with my hands which are then shifting around each other either the start point or the actual pattern that it is or how it's offset from the other stuff very, very intriguing, very intriguing at all. But not only that, they also sell expanders for it. So you can add another two channels, then another two channels, and another two channels, up to, I think, 12, I think, in total, at least, or something like that. I don't know, but it's a great idea. At least it would be a perfect idea if it wasn't so bleeding expensive. It does make you pause, really, because it's on Kickstarter at the moment, and they're looking to raise about $32,000, and they're about halfway there. 24 people have given it a go, which gives you an indication of how much it costs. But yeah, to get in on the super early bird, you're looking at the best part of $800. That's just for the unit itself. I mean, it's gorgeous. Don't get me wrong. I think this could be a, a game changer <laughs> word in terms of uh, rhythmic sequencing, at least for, for my system. That could be amazing. It just depends. You know, it all, all comes down to how usable that front end is. It all comes down to how easy it is to switch things about. Because Euclidean rhythms, you tend to leave them running. And this has that factor uh, built into it. But then are you shifting it around? Are you, are you changing it? How changeable? How shifting? And how much is that actually going to be useful within your set? I don't know. I mean, it's... I'm really taken by the look of it. I'm really taken by the, the layout and the design decisions that they've made on it. I love the fact that it can be extended. And you can add further channels to it. But, yeah, yeah I don't know. It's, it's unclear to me at the moment whether uh, the amount of money you'd have to spend on it is really going to be able to replace a lot of other stuff that you have. Sorry about that. You know. Oh, yes tape anyway back to the major tom uh fabulous fantastic is it worth the money is the question really that's on everybody's lips and why is it that even at an early bird you can't get it just it doesn't feel doesn't feel super early birdie is all i'm saying anyway they're halfway to their goal so if you fancy something like this get in there now i would because it would be a great thing for them to succeed at this it's just going to need another Another 25, 30 people, which does make you wonder about Kickstarter sometimes. G4 Software have managed to find another old ARP synth that everyone had forgotten about and nobody knew still existed and perhaps is not that really interested in. But it's called Access. Access. 
and it looks i mean it looks like a little odyssey it's quite cute really i mean the look of it is i mean it's just bang on exactly what we expect an arp sort of desktop machine to look like and this it's cute it's super cute super super cute what they're saying is i mean i don't know anything about it never heard of it never seen one never heard of one have you heard of one i've never heard of one but apparently it is full of lovely rich bassy tones the idea is that it's simple it's easy it's not going to tax your brain you're not having to wonder how to to remodulate or feed things in from anywhere else you can just dial up some nice presets you've got some cross modifiers and bing bang bosh bassy bassy synths bit of filter good good has a giant sound for a little synth oh yes now apparently according to marketing <laughs> It lends itself superbly to electronica, to cinematic, synth pop, dance, ambient, rock, prog rock, hip hop, and more. So yeah, not much else to say about that one really. So off you go, travel back to 1975, pick up the Axe or the Access from G4 Software and have a thoroughly, thoroughly fat, fruity, orangey time. Our friend Arthur Jolly is at it again. This time with his Rico drum, he's decided to squeeze in a bit of a tube driver and a spring reverb. So this is Rico Synth over in deepest, darkest uh, Brazil, I think it is, somewhere of that nature. And Arthur over there makes just the most fabulous analog drum machines and synthesizers. And the Rico drum is his long running analog drum machine. It sounds every bit like an 808 in, in every kind of way you could imagine, I suppose, but it's done in a fabulous console style. Nothing quite like it. It's the sort of thing you could just have sitting on a coffee table. It doesn't even need to be in your studio. It's just a beautiful object, a beautiful thing that can be both inspiring and lovely and mechanically gorgeous, as well as kicking out these very cool, very cool patterns of analog drum loveliness. Now with the tube driver, we've stuffed that inside, whack a great big tube on the front and a switch that just makes it go from a doom -chick -doom -chick -doom into a <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic, love it. And then you can swallow it up in its own bath of reverb. Just great, what a great thing to add to this thing. I mean, I guess most people buying boutique synthesizers will kind of have effects and other bits and pieces and processes to run them through. But heck, if it's got it built in, that's just all the better really. It makes it far more, more portable, more usable, simpler to set up and more enjoyable to play with. Because you can just sit there, generate some patterns, switch these things in and enjoy the ride. He's only making 15. I'll be surprised if there's any left. <laughs> but he's just started kicking them out so if that's the sort of thing that you fancy go grab one very very quickly neptune from spc plugins is interesting in as much as that it's a piece of hardware from a software company i always like it when these kinds of transitions happen when you get movement from someone who's been writing code into someone who actually has to put together a hardware interface and what they've gone for is a module called neptune it is eight lfos in a box each with an individual slider that makes it very wide so it's quite a big chunky module as a first one but in order to make best use of an lfo in that sort of context then perhaps space and visualization is really what you need each of the lfos is completely independent although can also completely syncable and clockable apparently they've loaded up each one with 256 waveforms so we're not just talking about your signs and your squares and your triangles no no you have all sorts of shapes going on <laughs> and you can dial it in for each one of them apparently there's also a building quantizer with loads of scales so potentially each lfo could actually sort of become an arpeggiator or a or a sequencer really in its own right they will have all sorts of tweakable nonsense going on inside and you can also use them together to create like an uber output so using uh, logic like ands and ors and xors and all that sort of business you can kind of merge these lfos together to produce a different lfo out the other end which is quite interesting so they're trying to pack a lot of stuff into this this new projection into our hardware realm of their software ideas but it's all in the interface as i keep saying that seems to be the theme for for this month's monthly is it's all in the interface how easy is it to do the thing that they're suggesting you might want to do with the thing that they're offering you that that my friends is the question 
Lukax Endless Processor is one of my favorite modules of the year, undoubtedly. I thought it was just inspired. Totally brilliant, totally simple, perhaps too simple for some people, I think, and also really easy just to make a mush. It was, it was quite easy just to make a mush of sound. But if you thought about it, if you worked with it a little bit, you could pull out just these moments of beauty which would then extend into the infinite darkness. And that's, that was a beautiful thing, man. I really, I really liked it, still like it, even though it's not currently in, in my case. However, <laughs> this has been out a little while and other people have also caught on to the fact that it's flipping excellent. But there was a, a criticism, one criticism that, I mean, I gave it as well as other people is that, that once you grab something, once something is in here endlessly, it kind of stays the same. And wouldn't it be nice if you could shift it a little bit, pitch it perhaps up and down? That might be nice. Yeah, and they've been listening and they thought, yeah, all right, we can do that. And so they've released an expander for it, just a little expander at the side. And that gives you two pitch inputs, one for each channel, and also a shift button, which I can't remember what that does. I'll think about that in a minute. But anyway, with the pitch side of things, you can now pitch whatever it is you've caught, whatever it is that's been smeared across each of the processors you can now pitch it about the place fantastic absolutely fantastic i cannot wait to get my hands on one of those oh i think the shift button lets you shift the octave up and down of each one directly or independently of each other which is pretty cool the other thing it does is provides an sd card slot so that you can store banks of your captures of your endless process captures onto that and then you can take that stick in your computer and using their web tool, I think, you can extract loops. So things that you've stuffed into here, you can pull off and use them in other places, which is really interesting too. Hmm. So good work on this. I mean, this was great to start with and to expand upon it in ways in which people I think really will respond to is excellent and throw in some extra functionality in the, in the ability to extract the waveforms that you're storing. Really good stuff. I like it. How about something completely mad from Monico? I think it is Monico Labs called Pico Loops. Now, apparently, this is a take on the Pico Core from Infinite Digits, which it's kind of a it's a looper. It's a looper sampler, sample player loop looper thing. <laughs> but it's wrapped up in a glorious uh, Monico Labs front end, and it's capable of holding something like eight minutes of lo-fi sampling stuff. It's based on a Raspberry Pi Pico, and so it has an enormous amount of like processing possibility within there. And it has a whole load of real-time effects. You can sort of, uh, you can filter, you can time stretch, you can mess about with the volume and wave folding, and apparently even sequence it with up to 128 steps of, of sequencing. What does it do? Oh, I don't know. It's kind of crackling around in the background, I imagine. It just sounded completely bonkers. And all of that bonkers tempo sync sampling sort of stuff is just stuffed into this module with this, this you know, strangely glaring face on the front. Stuff it into your modular and have it just go crazy with all sorts of sounds or rhythms or textures or loops or banging beats as seems to be seems to be the way. But the heck, it could be anything. It could be anything. Talking of mixers, as I was earlier, Threadbox has one called the Psychosis. Now, we might have seen this before. It's, it's been knocking around with their telepathy modules. The telepathy modules are these entire synth voices into a single little module, which they can then link together into some kind of polyphonic monster. I've seen it at, uh, at shows, and I've had a little play, and I'm just like, at the moment, I don't quite get the whole the whole thing. I mean, I get the idea. It's nice. You've got this this synth voice, and then you 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 chain them together to create polyphony. The question I have is kind of why, I suppose. And also, it feels unruly. And I think I need to get together with it, sit down, and quite try to understand exactly what it is that's going on. Because as it is, it seems you know playing with it at a show where it's already been messed about by half a dozen people. I didn't really get a feel for how you're how you're controlling everything from one place. Anyway, this is all this is all by the by because what we're talking about is what happened at the end and all of it was plugged into this module which they hadn't released up until now called the Psychosis. And this is an interesting module because it's a six channel stereo mixer. Six channels note. 
<laughs> which is useful, good to know, but it has built-in effects and weird panning, spreading stuff. So, basics. Stick your stuff in the top. You've got a, a panning slider which will either bring everything together or spread it apart, or then flip it. I mean, you don't need to know where everything is. I mean, we always spend all this time fussing around trying to pan stuff into different places. If you've just got a load of modular stuff going into one place, just to have it spread, that's that's genius by itself without having to you to have to individually think about where things are going just push it apart and that's going to give you that sort of space and breathing room and sense of depth that was not there previously but then you can just throw in some reverbs and chorus some delay or flanging i think it is just very simply it's there you're not having to root out or ox out and back in and mix other stuff in pre or post and worry about all that sort of business it's just there so what i think is the winning formula of this particular module is just that it does all this stuff for you so you don't have to think about it you need a destination for all of your stuff that's happening you can just plug it into there you can spread it around add a reverb job done job done perhaps all it's missing would be something like a headphone output because it has just a just a master out that's that's it and for so it doesn't really make itself an output module as such like most sort of performance mixes do and of course there's no muting or well, individual panning as, as I mentioned but there's no muting or soloing or, or level correction between them. you're going to be doing that elsewhere so it's a very neat solution for a small case or if you're just trying to do something very simply and you're going to be mixing and doing those sorts of things elsewhere or or you just don't care you don't really care about that sort of thing which is which is also fine and the one last little element is that it has its own LFO built in, so you can move the spread about. So you can start things wanging, which is nice. Never have enough of that. So yeah, fascinating. I'd really like to get into the whole telepathy thing at some point. some point, I'm going to have to borrow a whole bunch from Dreadbox and see if I can get my head around it. And finally, for the new stuff of December, we have the Lo-Fi U-Tape or Microtape Scrubber. This is from our friends over at Beep Boop Electronics, who are awesome, <laughs> absolutely awesome. Uh, Jack over there, just, he, he's, a, he's the best possible nutcase you could possibly meet. And he builds these extraordinary devices. A lot of it is tape based. And he's been working on this one U sort of tape scrubber thing where you've got like bits of cassette tape running around you, one new thing. Anyway, he's still working on that, but while he's working on that, he's sort of become aware that people are going, ah, oh, it looks amazing, but I have no idea what I would do with it. So using, I mean, he's already built things using regular cassettes and other bits and pieces and stuffed all them together. You've got these strange, bizarre handmade devices that have been modded and hacked and are stuck onto the side of things, making crazy, crazy sounds. Anyway, he's bringing all of that down into something simpler. Now, this is a Eurac module, the Microtape Eurac Scrubber, which uses microtapes like you find in a dictaphone or in an answering machine, that kind of thing. So these mini tapes, so these mini tapes stuck onto a Eurac module, which then has a playhead and a record head. They might be the same, I can't remember, which you essentially feed audio in and record to the tape, record your tape loop that goes round and then audio comes out and then you can play around with the pitch, play around the direction and the speed that it's going through, that kind of thing. You can drop in erasing by pushing the head up into it. <laughs> you can erase bits so it gets a bit choppy or you can do sound on sound recording. So you're building up levels of, of, of chorus because it's like chorus and flanging is essentially the the delay of one signal upon another when you're doing sound on sound that's kind of what you're doing to some degree and so you're building up these these choruses or these reverb sounds as this stuff goes over itself and apparently it's quite hard to 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 erase it off once you've done that so it's a bit experimental it's a bit kind of up and down is it what is it working is it not how does that work um, it comes with a single cassette and five loops that you have to sort of work out how to thread through each one. But you can also build your own loops, of course, which is not, it's not difficult. It's not something I've ever done. It's something I would like to do. I've never spliced tape in my life, you see, and that's something that uh, I feel perhaps I'm missing out on, a bit of tape splicing. But anyway, the microtape scrubber looks fantastic, sounds 
crazy and terrible but in all the best possible ways and is the sort of thing that you would just love to have this mechanically operated thing slapped onto your lovely gorgeously otherwise beautiful instagrammable euro rack top job is building some now there's like half a dozen left you have to go and stick in a, a deposit and it'll cost about 300 quid when they're ready which will be in a few weeks time this just in and filed i imagine under are you mad <laughs> is the string thing from nervous squirrel it's always interesting things coming out of that laboratory should we call it right the string thing right it's a eurac module eurac module with a ring pull well no not a ring pull it's got a ring that you pull that pulls a string the string is attached to a three-axis joystick the idea i don't know what the idea what's the idea the idea is i think that you you extract the string and then it gives you very wide access joystick-esque control over modulation and generation of voltages <laughs> and that kind of thing so your man says that he's used this in his 5u modular system for some years and you you <laughs> you essentially uh, take it to a party plug it in and give the string to somebody who's passing by and they go ooh, and they go ooh, ah, ooh, and move it about and it changes things it's very very interactive very exciting <laughs> very crazy i mean the the one of the strange things about Nervous Squirrel is that the quality is exemplary. It's always, it's sort of handmade, but in the hands of an artistic genius. And it's quality stuff. I mean, this is probably made from bits of old stuff lying about in a skip, I should think. But it ends up in this perfectly crafted, professional looking module. Uh, you have X, Y, and Z arranged, you have offset, uh, you've got control and inversion, you can invert it one way or the other. I mean, ultimately, it's a joystick control, but expanded into a big way. So you could attach things to it or twang it or put weights on it or not, or, or turn it in. I don't really know. He suggests using two so you can pull out two rings and do some kind of modulation in that way. It's totally bonkers totally brilliant now in order to accommodate three meters of string which is what it gives you it's quite a deep module it's got a whole whack and great big spindle at the back that this all goes into because you're you're going in this direction and that is also creating uh, voltage as well as the so essentially 3d space is what you're exploring with this thing fascinating what a fascinating idea <laughs> It's almost like you're trying to start it up. So you're there at your gig and boom, 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 boom. That's just brilliant. What an exciting thing. I've explored many sort of haptic, interactive uh, methods of control and generating stuff, you know, with, with light beams and light resistance or tracking of hands and gloves and stuff. But this is doing that sort of thing, but with a very physical attribute, which is this string. And somehow that makes it even more extraordinary. So yeah, there's no video yet, sadly. There's one coming, so I'm probably going to feature this again in January. <laughs> monthly. But heck, I just saw it over my tea on Instagram. So I thought I'd better tell you about it. So, right. The best of the year then. Best gear of the year. I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. I'm just going to run through the highlights from each month so i'm not like the best things of the year overall just january february all the way through what i thought was the best thing out of each of those months ready steady let's go so january the ssl 12 not very impressive name but it's an audio interface oh, that's a bit boring yeah i know but audio interfaces are one of those necessities in life and this is i think the best one i found it's replaced my audio fuse. I've been using an audio fuse for many years, Arturia. It's a good, squat, chunky audio interface. Great feature set on the audio fuse. Sounded okay to me as well. I liked all the things about it. It just got a little bit old, hot, and sticky. And so I've been looking for a replacement. And the SSL 12 came along just at the right sort of time, I think. It fulfills all the requirements that I need from an audio interface, which is a nice, big, fat volume knob on, on the desktop. 
I don't care anything that's rack based, no, there's no interest to me whatsoever. But for my own main system, I want something that's on the desktop with a dirty great big knob, and that's what that does. That's not all it does. There's plenty of audio interfaces that do that. The other thing it has is fantastic preamps. It sounds flipping awesome coming from those SSL consoles. You've even got a button you can press to put in the 4K 4000 console rigmarole circuitry or something. <laughs> I don't know. It's brilliant. It sounds really, really nice. Four channels of that. So I've got two for mic and guitar and then two for my synths and stuff going through. The perfect combination of things. That's all I need. Need nothing more than that. It has a great mixer application so you can route everything from everything to everything and understand what's coming back. It's got good loopback facility so you can have all sorts of playback from other bits of software going through this mixer all at the same time. So that means I can run software and I can run streaming software and route from one to the other, which is vital, something the Audio Fuse didn't have. The drivers for it have been absolutely rock solid. It's nice and fast, sounds fantastic. Trying to think, I'm looking at it over there, trying to think, is there anything I don't like about it? What don't I like? It could do with some mute switches, some physical mute switches, I would say. That would be one thing that would be useful, just so you could mute the output very quickly and easily rather than turning it down, or mute an individual channel. That would be good. But you can do that in the software, you know. It's also got two headphones and you can correct different mixes for those. It's great, it's just a really solid, worthwhile, takes up quite a bit of space, but I'm very, very, very happy with it. February, the Oxy Instruments Coral. Undoubtedly one of the most interesting Eurat models to come along in a long time. It has, oh, I don't know, 10 different uh, synthesizer engines in there. It's polyphonic, it's multi-timbral, you can run different things at once. You can control it all very easily via MIDI or most of it somewhat satisfiedly via control voltage too. So it will fit into any system really and it gives you a really good range of alternative timbres. It's sometimes, you know, a little bit fiddly to get around or what menu am I in and what algorithm am I on and what is the light show actually telling me, but Ultimately, within this small space, you've got an entire synthesizer voice with some very, very pleasing sounds. And it's continuing uh, to develop and get better and better. So the big video review that I did was really on a pre-production module, which had some stability issues of which they really aren't there anymore. It's a rock solid piece of work and there's nothing quite like it, I don't think. March, we saw that this is not rocket science, Wobbler 2. Now this was a crazy idea, which was to take a, an LFO and turn it into a drum synth because I mean that's what you do it's absolutely what you do isn't it no not really so the wobbler was a great uh, dual channel I think LFO two things twanging about that had lots of different wave shaping in it and interesting bits and pieces but they seemed to find this is not rocket science so they had a whole load of space on the computerized the gummagey stuff inside so they thought they'd pump in a bunch of samples and other bits and pieces and so now you have this mode that you can turn it into drum mode and you can scan through uh, different drum sounds with different uh, you know pitch and tonal possibilities and it turns itself into kind of a linear you know, one sound after the, each other monophonic drum machine which is brilliant. With the right amount of CV going in, you can select different sounds and have it run an entire drum show. It's really, really good fun, <laughs> and it sounds phenomenal. And at the same time, it's also a fantastic LFO. So, you know, double trouble, double whammy, great, great stuff. Here's a weird one for you. <laughs> it's, it's Entropy and Sons Recursion Studio. I mean, in some respects, I just really like the name, Entropy and Sons good stuff what is it some kind of visual synth I don't think it's it's quite made it yet or has it quite emerged is it still under pre-order or pre something or other I don't know but I just really liked it it's kind of kaleidoscopy crazy effects it's a box got a couple of knobs on it a bit of a screen you move things about and it just does crazy visuals and I'm into that it's expensive which is a shame but you do have buttons and knobs and a display and a lot of potential for awesome visuals. So, you know, 
Apparently it's shipping in February. Uh, it was first seen, I think, at NAMM last year. Probably going to be there again this year. I was just really very, very taken by the quality of the, the possibilities and the fact that it's a it's kind of an engine that you could incorporate into your system that can be reacting to what's going on. There's a lot of attempts at visuals at the moment. A lot of software, interesting software stuff, some interesting hardware-based stuff that's that's not really grabbed me, I have to say. Whereas this looks like it's absolutely the bee's knees. But is it too expensive? Probably for me, certainly. <laughs> In May, of course, we had Super Booth, and probably the most interesting thing to come out of that was a Tip Top Audio Art System. Now, this is kind of redesigning Eurorack into, into a better, potentially newer, more interesting format that could handle both polyphony and incredibly accurate data transfer movement, information movement. So it's, it's reporting or hoping to keep oscillators far more in tune with each other all the time to sort out that kind of issue as well at the same time as running down the same sort of cables that we're already used to and then offering polyphony in Eurorack that uses multi-core cables through these USB-C cables to send multi-channel audio and data I think see it starts to sort of fall apart the more you talk about it the more it sorts of falls apart which is both frustrating and fascinating because I'm sure there's something there that, that makes sense I'm just yet to hear a proper explanation that really captures it. I need it simplified, broken down, because there's 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 at least two different things going on that I don't fully grasp. <laughs> Although every time I speak to Tip Top, I go, oh yeah, right, yeah, got it, got it. And then a couple of days later, it's like, what? I don't quite understand it again. And you go look back over the materials and go, no, this doesn't really make any sense. But I, I have got to the point that there's two different things. There's polyphony and multi-channel audio over these USB-C cables, which are really annoying that it's the same cable as something else. Just do it differently. <laughs> because we've had this before with the whole TRS MIDI thing. You know, it ends up just being a disaster because you get confused and muddled up and you think one thing means another. But anyway, so you're using standard patch cables, which are taking digital information from one thing to another in order to control stuff. And then you're using multi-core USB-C cables to make something for something else. Why is it that I think this is awesome? I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's currently a bit of a mess. But I'm hoping that it will start revealing itself this year. And we will start to understand it. And we'll see, oh, yeah, that's just brilliant. Because I think somewhere in there is an element of total genius. We shall see. We shall see. But I thought it was, I think, I still maintain, despite my bafflement, that it's pretty cool. Tune, the Amp Star Song. It's a rotational sequencer. It's gorgeous, beautiful, and of course in the hands of Emily the Harpist, it just becomes the most wonderful thing in the world. So this is some old hippie who lives on a hill somewhere in America making fabulously <gasps> esoteric and gorgeously spiritual said, bits of old... Hardware, wow. and this is this is just an awesome thing. And then this it's an awesome thing. I think you color it in or something. Wheel it rotates speed. around. It's like a record of uh, of transparency, and you make marks where things happen, and it it does its thing. Brilliant. Just totally, totally wonderful. Uh, July brought us the Brinter. This fella here. Gorgeous fun I mean it's the most fun I've had in ages I think and this is a collaboration between Air Instruments and this is not rocket science and it's kind of a granular thing you stick sound in and you mess about with it you're not really sure why not really sure why moving that makes it sound different and this also makes it sound different and then that again and then it pitches about the place or suddenly it's choral and then it's weird and then it's random and then it's something else and then you're moving this around and you've got these lights that are going oh you know, it's lights, it's weirdness, it's randomization, it's granular, it's grains shooting about the place, it's chordal, it's random, it's noise, it's... <laughs> and it's just, you have no idea, and it's a lot of fun, so everyone should have one of those. August brought us the Blue Cack Endless, which I've already told you about, which was fantastic, and is probably my pick of the year, as something that just really... I felt grabbed my intention and inspired me like no other module had uh, this year. I thought it was a, a wonderful piece of work. Wonderful and fascinating and I will do more with it. 
September brought us the Door Project. Now, what what is that? Well, this is a collaboration between Bitwig Studio, who have hit version 5, which is excellent, and Studio One, who have hit version 6.5, which is excellent. But with those two updates, they brought in this collaboration called Door Project. The idea being is that you can shuffle a project from one door to another if you save it in this in this format. Now, we've already done this before with MIDI files and with um, OMF and ASS or some, uh, some other. There are some other ways where you can share projects. You can export from one project in Pro Tools and import it into Logic or export from Cubase and import it into Fruity Loops. You know, that sort of thing, that does exist, but it's always been one thing or another. It's never really contained all the information. It's only either contained an arrangement or perhaps some edits or perhaps some other things and never really the whole shebang. And what Door Project aims to do is provide the whole shebang. So tracks of audio properly mapped out and arranged with all of the, the fades and uh, gain structure that was in the original. All of the channel settings from um, from the mixing, from the panning, from the levels. And this includes all the way down to the plugins, third party plugins, all load up the same in both projects. But not only that, also the internal, more generic plugins that ship with your system. It will take that and it will load up similar internal plugins on the other door. And it works. It also does clips, so it will take all the clip stuff from Bitwig and put that in Studio One that will completely ignore it. But if Studio One did support all of the clip launching business, it would also carry that across. So if Ableton Live got on board with Door Project, you could shift from projects from Ableton Live into Bitwig and be able to run them pretty much seamlessly from one to the other. Why would you do this? Well. There's a few reasons. I mean, there's lots of reasons for collaboration. If you're working with somebody else, to be able to shoot them a project that they can open very easily and they don't have to have the same door as you. That's always a good one. But there's also the ability to use the different strengths of different doors. You might want to move a project from one place to another. You might want to, to really get into the, the fascinating grid section of Bitwig but you don't actually like it as a as a streaming door for your final mixing. You want to do that somewhere else. And rather than having to produce stems or output, mix everything to audio to stick it into something else, you can just take the whole project across. I think it's a wonderful uh, attempt at opening up uh, the formats between different doors that make it easier for us to move from one to the other. I think that's brilliant. I think that's a, an important development and technology. October saw us at both Synthfest and the other one, Bristronica, and probably the best thing we saw was the play fader. The play all day play fader. It's a box, a couple of faders on it, shoot them all about. Fantastic. Program it to do whatever you like, control whatever you like, MIDI, CV, all sorts of different things. You can automate it, route, route it about, make it do stuff, make it turn it into a sequencer, turn it into a modulator. It was fun. The guy running the show was, was brilliant and engaging. He runs these retreats for, for burnt out electronic music people to go and just chill, to just to chill out on a nice beach somewhere, in a nice villa, somewhere where it's warm and just reconnect with themselves and their electronic instruments. And that is also awesome. So coming out of that vibe is this device, this desktop device with which you can just enter into controlling whatever it is you want to control. And that was pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to, to seeing that in the flesh sometime very soon. And finally for November, probably the thing that caught my attention the most was the, the Chroma from hologram because I've got I've got this thing over here right I've got the microcosm everybody has a microcosm I think this fella hologram sent this to pretty much everyone and I was absolutely delighted to be included in that that was just awesome it's lovely to be approached by someone who says do you want to try a product I love that I just love it and even though I saw this all over Instagram other people were having a go having a much better idea than me I was super chuffed to give this a go and I never fully understood it. I found it difficult. Got this menu here. I'm never quite sure what all the differences between everything is. I'm never always sure what this was happening, you know, what I was controlling. I'm never sure what these did. I mean, <laughs> basically what I'm saying is I never really looked into it deep enough. 
I kind of wanted it to be instant and it wasn't. It required a bit of thought and I, I, I never really found the time to devote to it enough. However, every now and again I'd stumble upon something awesome and I'd have it sitting uh, as part as one of the um, sends on my mixer and then I'd root stuff to it. That was fantastic. Absolutely loved it. Anyway, they've come out with this new thing called the Chroma Console and it just looks amazing. And one of the reasons it does, I mean, it looks amazing to start with. They did a fantastic demonstration video, which everyone really should up their game. Manufacturers up your game on uh, demonstration videos is very, very important. It's totally inspiring. But what overall it said to me was that they sorted out this interface. No more trying to work out where you are on this thing and pushing the thing in and encoder and stuff. It was laid out. Each section was laid out with its own controls ready to go, you could see what was happening, there was no mystery to it, no fiddling about, and it just gave out these beautiful vintage vibes. Just lovely, absolutely lovely, totally nailed that one, and I would very much like to get my hands on one at some point, <laughs> most definitely. So does that leave me with December? I suppose so. What did I like the most? Looking at my list. <laughs> Well, I really enjoy the Mariana, I have to say, uh, the Moog software synth, that was fantastic. But also, I'm really fascinated by the Floating Knobs Cuisine. I think that could be, that could be really interesting as far as the sequencer goes. But the one I've actually put my money on is the Beep Boop Microtape Scrubber. Yes, I've thrown them 75 quid for a deposit and I have to pay, come up somehow, going to have to furiously write some articles to come up with the the rest of the money for when it's ready in a couple of weeks time so that is definitely going to be the winner then the microtape scrubber best of december best of the first part of the year um and we'll see how that goes as for the best of 2023 oh, i just don't care really whatever whatever you think tell me in the comments what you think was the best thing because uh, there's been lots of great stuff this year and i hope there will be stuff coming up so that'll do. I think that's plenty. I haven't talked this much in ages. I don't think, as you can tell, from my, my voice rapidly disintegrating. It's also started raining and I have to go and make the tea. So that'll do. That'll do. What's coming up? Lots of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff. I've got fantastic things coming up in the next couple of months. Synth East, of course. Synth East. Still tickets left, plenty of room on all the workshops, on all the evening do's, on all the daytime do's. And we're doing some videos on that over the next couple of weeks just to, to chivvy it along and to explain and expand more upon it. I can also finally announce that on the Saturday night we've got, as I've already mentioned, Blamange and Ultra Marine playing. But before then, the warm-up slot that was going to be me, still me, but it's going to be now a never seen before trio, a triptych indeed of myself gaz williams Milo melodies all three of us playing at once it's gonna be chaos <laughs> never to be seen ever anywhere else that's the saturday night that's the end of february synthease.com go and have a look book yourself a ticket don't miss out don't miss out it's going to be fantastic and if there are any more manufacturers out there who need a table i still have a couple of tables left and i will be proactively uh punting them towards people over the next couple of weeks but if you have a product that you'd really like to show of a synthesizer variety then give me a shout it's only 150 quid for a table for a fabulous day in Norwich showing your stuff <laughs> otherwise I've got videos coming out of my ears tape stuff Eurac stuff DIY stuff um, all sorts all sorts it's, it's a fabulously exciting time because the best thing is that at the moment I've not really thought about work proper. I've just been thinking about it over the over the over the break and over having the flu, so I wasn't really able to do any work last week. So at the moment, my head is full of all these wonderful video ideas that are, of course, all going to be forgotten as I actually have to to do some work and pay the bills. But hey, at the moment, I'm in this place of complete ecstasy, thinking this could be wonderful, and I'm sure it will be. And I hope you had a good time and I hope that this year brings you much, much joy and satisfaction. I think this year is going to be a really interesting time. There's such technology out there, such things and vibes and music. It's just amazing, absolutely amazing. And I think, I genuinely feel there's a, a massive cultural shift about to happen, which is just going to move us along 
because we seem to be looking so backwards. We seem to be falling into these ideas that nostalgia is going to save us. Whereas I love nostalgia, but we need to go forward. We need to move into a place where we look after each other, where everything actually works rather than falters and fails and falls apart. That, I think, could be awesome. So anyway, there we go. I hope that was helpful. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. 